From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities, presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. The topic, financial crisis in our cities. Now, here is Peter Hackes. Many American cities are in financial crisis. There's nothing new about that. But recently, some cities have found themselves on the brink of bankruptcy. A recent study published by the American Enterprise Institute on the New York City financial crisis also surveyed the financial situations in six other major U.S. cities. That study shows that common factors causing ill health in our cities include an eroded tax base, an influx of unskilled poor and minority groups, decaying inner cities, obsolete services, unionization of public employees, and an increasing demand for anti-congestion and anti-pollution expenditures. New York City may just be the first in a series of municipalities faced with economic crisis. Welcome to another roundtable discussion brought to you by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Today, four experts will tackle the topic financial crisis in our cities. Introducing our guests and moderating our discussion will be Melvin Laird. Mr. Laird is a former congressman who later served as Secretary of Defense. He also was counselor to the President of the United States. Mr. Laird is now senior counselor for national and international affairs for the Reader's Digest magazine. Now, here is Mr. Laird. Welcome to the Public Policy Forum sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute. Our discussion topic, the financial crisis of the cities. On our panel today, we have some very distinguished members who have, can make a great contribution, I feel, to this particular subject. First, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Sidney Jones, who has the responsibility of economic policy in the Treasury Department. Next, Senator Percy. Senator Charles Percy of Illinois is the senior senator from the state of Illinois and of course has a very close relationship with one of the major cities of the United States, Chicago. Then we have Senator Jacob Javits. Senator Javits is the senior senator from the state of New York, and New York recently has had some very serious problems, particularly in regard to its largest city. Governor Hugh Carey will be joining us in just a few moments. He's had a little difficulty uh, getting from the Washington National Airport to this uh, studio here in the Statler Hilton Hotel in the city of Washington. I'd like to ask, uh, to start off our discussion today, the Treasury Secretary, uh, Sidney Jones, who has the responsibility in the economic policy area, whether the Treasury feels that the problems of New York are sy symptomatic of problems facing other cities. Almost have to give a yes and no answer. Every city is faced with the problems of recession the problems of inflation that erodes both their tax base, makes their services much more expensive. However, I think when you talk about cities as we see it at the Treasury, there is quite a range. Uh, many of the city and states were moving towards surplus by 1972, 1973, before the recession caught them. And so I think that New York City, uh, with its very difficult problems, is representative of what happens to all cities and states when you have economic uh, problems such as a recession. But I do not think that most cities or most states have advanced to that uh, stage of problem. Senator Javits, can the city of New York bring about the necessary changes so that uh, it can in the future live within its receipts and uh, have a balanced financial outlook as far as the future is concerned? My answer is distinctly yes. It can and it will. Uh, for the next three years, the federal government, through the intercession of the Congress and of President Ford, will enable us to deal with 
seasonal cash problems, which every business and every city has, that is, the receipts of taxes come in a little bit later than the expenditures in a given year. And in New York, that, uh, that transit may take up to two billion three a year. The United States will lose nothing, it's fully secured, uh, and the loan is simply on a revolving basis for one year. But it will enable the city to go through the three years. At the end of the three years, and three years will be years of privation and sacrifice, in the sense of a sharp diminution of services. Senator Percy, you have a, a constituency in the city of Chicago. We don't hear much about Chicago's problems. Do they have any? Well, of course Chicago has. Uh, it's a large metropolitan area, second largest in the country, and it has some of the same problems that uh, New York has faced in every other urban area. Uh, or since World War II, there's been a flight to the suburbs, both of business, it has grown rapidly outside the city, but has left the city, some of it, and the, the flight uh, of the affluent uh, white population has gone to the suburbs, taking their tax base with them. Uh, the federal government has accelerated this by building superhighways and expressways to move people rapidly, and has also done it through the subsidization of middle-income America through FHA, making it possible for them to build their own, own their own homes in the suburbs. Uh, it has also uh, been hurt, every city has, by large uh, high crime rates, uh, by inflation and the cost of doing uh, business in the city, and then by the severe restrictions on the states. And in Illinois, this has caused the state of Illinois to deny assistance to Chicago schools just recently, uh, this month. So we have the same problems, but what we have that New York hasn't had is a, what I'd call a stable government. We've had a mayor uh, for 20 years who knows every in and out and who is a sound fiscal conservative and for that reason he's backed by uh, many Republican businessmen because of his fiscal conservatism and he's run a very tight ship and he's had deep co close cooperation with the industrialists and the banking community in running a tight ship and of course he has absolute control over a city council so that uh, that's the big difference that Chicago has had, and statistics in comparison with New York are quite startling uh, as it uh, relates now to the AA bond rating that Chicago has. Well, can uh, New York bring back its uh, discipline in the fiscal area during the next uh, three to four years? I believe it can, Mel. I think that the, uh, the veil of uh, tears through which we're passing is a very sobering experience. Now, give or take the usual 10% for corruption, waste, gold plating, politics, etc. Even call it 15. And there's no estimate about New York that places the fraud and the chicanery above 15. But even if you grant that, the fact is that there is still a very, very solid base in New York and that its troubles can be overcome. Uh, but the, I, I think that uh, Senator Percy is absolutely right. Now, whether they're sitting on a keg of dynamite because they've covered up so much and sat on so much for so many years, only time will tell. But in the meantime, uh, they've done very well, very much better than New York. And we must now, because our hearts, and that's been our big trouble in New York, have been much bigger than our pocketbook, uh, we have to cut our cloth accordingly. I don't believe that should represent any diminution of the final <clears throat> basic services in New York, because that's where the citizen's own self-help comes in, which I believe can prove the difference. But we have to build that in the next few years, and we have to build a much better uh, business and, fin and financial outlook by the officials who are elected. In addition, New York has suffered from demography. Remember that we've taken from the South and the Civil Rights Revolution uh, probably as much as a million and a half, maybe more, of people who left the South because of inhospitable conditions there, in their view. And we've taken almost a million from Puerto Rico because the Puerto Ricans are Americans and are free to travel. Now, if our country wants to restrain travel and violate the Constitution or change it, New York could do much better. But in our case, they flocked to New York. My parents were immigrants, too, from Central Europe. And I'm sure that their manners were probably not much better than those of some of the newcomers to New York. But they got over it. They worked it out. I believe these New Yorkers will, too, who newly come. 
but we need this terribly difficult transition period to work it out in the ways that I've just described. So I think we'll make it, but I'm only giving an accounting for our troubles and what has caused our difficulty and the justification for the intercession of the federal government. You can hardly pile it on the back of New York if in New York we pay a living welfare of TAD, which is roughly $80 per person per month, whereas in another state like Mississippi, uh, the payment is somewhere between $20 and $30, and people just can't live on it. So they'll move, and they'll move to where their relatives are in New York. Of course, New York City only bears about 20% of that welfare cost itself. Isn't that true? The state and the federal government pick up the rest of that bill. Well, you know, it reminds me that the answer is yes. This New York City picks up 25%, but that reminds me of, uh, you know, prettier than who? Because Chicago picks up none. And there are very few states that require their cities to pick up any part of the welfare load. And when you realize that 25% is a neat $600 million a year, you begin to realize that New York has taken every rap, everyone, everyone in the book. Why? Because, as I say, it was thought by its own people, let alone the people of the rest of the country, that its wealth was limitless. All New York can take it. All the banks, all the brokerage firms, all the airlines, all the radio networks, everything. New York's got it all. But it hasn't. That's, that's not a, a bottomless source of money either. And we're facing reality today in a very painful way. Senator Percy, uh, the, this whole question of debt management is one that it's staggering the debt. As you look at New York City's debt and the New York State debt and compare it with some of the other areas of the United States, do you think reforms are needed as far as uh, municipal financing are, is concerned uh, as regards the tax-exempt status and perhaps substituting some federally insured bonds that pay taxes and so forth? moving in a different direction in that area? I think reforms are needed. I think, first of all, as the Secretary has suggested, uh, we need more accountability and we need better accounting in the cities. Uh, a city can issue bonds uh, where a corporation or executives would be thrown in jail if they ever issued bonds on that basis. They tell so little. In fact, they mislead uh, the bond purchaser on, uh, on the representations made. Elmer Stotts, Controller General of the United States, told the Senate just this week that uh, there'd be no use even auditing the city of Washington's books because the books are in such horrible shape that they, an auditor couldn't even make sense out of them. Now, if that's true, if a corporation did that, the SEC would file against them, uh, and we've regulated uh, corporate bonds and corporate uh, financial uh, structuring for years. I think we're going to have to do the same thing if we're going to put our cities back on a sound basis. Now, I think many cities are, and I think uh, Senator Javits has, has raised the issue. Is Chicago sitting on a, on a, a, a keg of dynamite here? Uh, we don't want to destroy the rating of our cities. Every city in this country is not in bad shape. In fact, many of them are in good shape. Chicago is in much better shape than the state of, of uh, Illinois, where in New York it's the reverse. The state is in better shape than the, uh, than the city. And certainly, I, I bled for Senator Chavez. He's done the most magnificent job against the worst odds I've ever seen. An uphill battle every step of the way. But he's been extraordinarily cooperative in working something out. In Chicago, we've tried to do it the other way. Never spend more than you take in. We have, uh, even in anticipation in short-term borrowing, which New York goes into far too heavily, We've never, in short-term borrowing, borrowed more than 75% of our tax receipts. New York goes right up to 100% and, and sometimes more. beyond because they mislead, you see, as to what those revenues are going to be. They overstate their revenues. We understate our revenues. Our debt ratio, therefore, today is uh, against New York. We have a $1,678 indebtedness in New York and only $432 per capita in Chicago. In New York, the bond, uh, the indebtedness went up 102 percent in the last two years. We went up 62 percent in Chicago. So we're holding the lid down even with inflation. And on a percentage of evaluation, property evaluation, it's 16 percent in New York. It's only 4 percent in Chicago. So we're not sitting on any keg of dynamite. We're a very soundly structured city. Our state 
is not in that kind of shape. The city's in very, very good shape. As a ratio of, of, uh, of uh, indebtedness to income, we're quite low in uh, Chicago, 9%, 35%. Uh, in New York. So there's really no basis for comparison, but I think as a result of this work that Governor Kerry has put in and, and uh, Senator Javits, New York is back now on the road to recovery. I think they're going to make it too, but it's going to be a tough cooperative effort. Your joint uh, committee has been doing some studies of the method of distribution as far as revenue sharing is concerned and its effect on this problem. Are you ready to recommend some changes in that? I don't believe that we ought to change very much in it because if we do, we're not going to get it. We ought to change in the sense that the federal government ought to have more to say about what's done with the money. To many municipalities and many states, it is just kind of an extra perquisite that comes in and doesn't really, isn't really built in in an intelligent way to added services, which is what our... Uh, we want to welcome the governor of New York, who's made it from the airport, and we're glad to have you here, Hugh. This is Secretary Sid Jones. Sorry about that. Well, we understand uh, we've been having a very interesting discussion about the problems of the cities, and uh, we've gotten into the question of revenue sharing and possible changes in the uh, method of distribution. In the discussion, it came up that 70% uh, of all of the federal aids are going uh, to 70% of our people that are in the metropolitan areas, but there is uh, concern as to whether the distribution formulas are correct in the present Revenue Sharing Act. If I may just finish that answer, Mel, I think they're, they're not fair to the cities. New York, for example, New York City gets about $250 million a year. Uh, out of roughly almost six billion dollars in revenue sharing. And even the state uh, only gets about 10 percent of the total. That is about 600 million a year. The reason is that revenue sharing is not adjusted to the big factor of need and the concentration of need. It is mainly on a population basis, etc. But it does not, and the formula therefore is weighted in favor of cities which may very well not need it as against cities which need it very, very urgently because of the pressure of their problems. But as I said a minute ago, if I had any real feeling that we wouldn't jeopardize the whole thing by pressing for major reforms, I'd be hot for them. But I, I have the deep feeling that we're better off going along with the present situation for a while yet, because I think if we start to change the formula, again, it is likely to be changed against us. That is against the big congested really needy cities like New York rather than for us at this time. Isn't this really a, a problem in the way the Senate is constituted constitutionally? We face it in almost every issue uh, with the votes cast of two votes from a state with half a million people, the same as two votes from a state of 20 million people. Uh, you have to compromise it out. And it's a battle between the House and the Senate, the House tending more towards population centers those of us from urban industrialized areas fighting for the higher formula where the people are and uh, the smaller states obviously saying we've got the same votes you've got, we want our share, in fact we want a disproportionate share, right. we want it based on territory rather than people and that's the, the way we net it out on a sort of a compromise. Well the, the, the final, uh, the, the last, you know, the basic line as they say may come because members are going to begin to realize that whatever they don't pay in the peas, they're going to pay in the bananas. In other words, if cities get in, in, in very, very real trouble, uh, they're going to have to do something about it anyhow. And so they might as well make these formulas more on a self-help basis than they otherwise would. Governor Kerry, will New York make it? Well, of course, uh, Mel, because uh, senators uh, are well aware that the uh, timely help which the president recommended is now a matter of uh, of course I believe the appropriation will come forth in time but the key thing is uh, the financial base is there now to rescue the city from a default but making it uh, means more than that uh, it means the redesign if you will and redirection of many federal uh, grant programs uh, to cope with the sprawl and the extension of the population into the suburbs and treating the 
problems of transportation, housing, and economic development on a regional kind of concept. Because uh, Houston is a healthy city because under the law of the state of Texas, Houston can follow its, uh, its sprawling population into the suburbs by annexation, and therefore it never loses its tax base. But uh, New York can watch uh, industry and families move out and then return as commuters uh, for employment or recreation or cultural diversion, but can't claim a share of the revenues that uh, they need to, to uh, in the city uh, because historically, just as the uh, Senate is constituted, it's very difficult to get a commuter tax or a commuter assessment of any kind through a state legislature because people will not vote for things that adversely impact the incomes of their constituents who live outside the city which needs the money. It's curious on the revenue sharing point, uh, as you well know, I was on the Ways and Means Committee when we designed that formula. It's not always the fault of the federal government that a formula is not perfect or workable. Uh, when we tried to uh, design the formula to fit each of the states, every time we ran the computer runs on the state of New York, the circuit breakers and the fuses blew on the computer and the lights popped and everything happened because historically the Duke of York, who was the principal owner of the grants that became New York, uh, gave out uh, feudal, uh, uh, if you will, gems to his friends and villages, towns, counties, and all sorts of uh, little government units uh, have no correspondence. You can have a village which is larger than a city in parts of New York, and a county which uh, gets an allotment, but within the county, a city may have more of the burden. So when you try to fit the formula to uh, a map where the localities by name are different and by design have different functions, the formula doesn't work. Therefore, I think the federal government has an opportunity when they design these formulas in revenue sharing or any kind of a block grant to require some kind of standardization of boundaries and function uh, as Connecticut has done. The state of Connecticut has the county unit of government, and that's the basic unit around the state of Connecticut. It makes it much more simple to deal with uniform kinds of, uh, of governmental entities. Whereas New York, as I stated going back to the, its origin, uh, under the Duke's grant, still has uh, an incorporated village, unincorporated village, uh, counties which have supervisors, some have uh, county legislatures, others do not. It's impossible to design a formula when there's no uh, uniform base for governmental activity within a state. Therefore, both within the state and interstate, we should use the federal leverage to go toward regionalization because you're never going to settle the transportation problems of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut unless you treat the region. The economic uh, base as well for economic development is better treated on a, uh, a tri-state or interstate basis. The Port of New York Authority, which goes back to the days of Alfred E. Smith, is a compact between the states, so the port is treated as an entirety. Those kinds of things could pull together in better fashion the basic strengths of the region, and the federal government would be in a better position than to design programs to treat the entire region. But isn't that one of the great problems that people have a fear? Now, I can see where regional government does make sense. In Cook County, for instance, if, if New York City had what we have, uh, Cook County picks up a great deal of health costs, where New York City has to pay it better than themselves. But this, once you get federal money coming in, you start to get this federal control, and then you start to get standardization. And that's where our federal system of government might possibly break down, and it raises a lot of fears in people. I know it does. That the uh, SOS is save our cities and save fine, our suburbs, fine, all because of the fear they're going to be standardized. But once they start accepting large federal grants, when there's York, bound to be some control for Senator, when New York City got in trouble, the President and Dr. Burns and Secretary Simon and all others involved, including the Senate Banking Committee and the House Banking Committee, required the city undertake certain reforms to qualify for federal aid. They were timely. They were necessary. We were going to do them anyway. But there's no Would way. you have done them anyway if they wouldn't have played hardball with you down here in Washington in the Congress and in the executive branch? 
we would have done them, but not with as much precipitate uh, uh, say, action as we had to do because default was looming on the horizon and uh, to his credit, the president required these things and we were going to get them done anyway, but it took some heavy hauling to do them. And now Could they're being done. it also help you, Governor, in trying to overcome some of the pressure of labor unions that really, in a sense, I, I'm all for labor unions, but now you, you, when, you, you when, did when not in have New York, they You really did not carried... have a political origin, Senator. You came out of Bell and Howell and you had that private uh, enterprise concept, which is a great thing to have. Well, uh, I, I know, but we have uh, labor unions and historically, that, that, that you know, Mayor Daly deals with in well, Chicago, I you might and they bring don't up, rip off the city. I the thought way. you might bring up Mayor Daly. Now, what he did historically is when he got a Democratic governor, he took many of the functions of uh, the city and gave them to the state, welfare, housing, courts, all of those things, and put them under the state auspices and got the state to pay for them. So that Mayor Daly does a wonderful job of running police, fire, and sanitation. You can do those things well and be a good mayor. We got a governor, a Republican governor, for four <laughs> years. What happened then? Uh, governor Ogilvie was the one that was being lauded by uh, by uh, Mayor Daley the other day. Well, that's since <laughs> Governor Walker became governor. But, but what he did, what what Mayor Daley did, was take a lot of functions that he felt the city could no longer handle with its tax base and transfer them to the state because he had an accommodation with the Democratic governor. Uh, mayor Bean would like to do the same thing with me. And I well may inherit the jail, the corrections, the courts, and some of the city university problems on a planned and program basis. That's inevitable. The states with the broader tax base uh, working with the federal government have to take on more functions that historically have been uh, handled by cities, but the cities can no longer manage to run a transportation system, a university system, uh, a hospital and health system, a peer and, and, and wharf system. All of the things that normally would be handled by a state were really being handled by New York City with a narrowing tax base. How How much you're finding out those were great years in the House of Representatives, aren't you? Yes, uh, they were very, I was able to point a uh, level finger of criticism constantly at the mismanagement of state and local governments as I became part of it. Well, I should Senator say Javits. that there's one important thing which we have to remember from the civil rights struggle. Uh, states' rights were a big issue then. And the argument which we made or for the civil rights legislation was that states' rights are fine so long as you have a performance standard. If they'll do the job, great. But if they won't do the job, we're all citizens of the United States, and the United States has to step in to do it. And I think that's the issue here that Senator Percy and the governor have posed. If the states will really do it and do it effectively, then I think the sentiment here is very strong. To, to devolve the responsibility downward. But if the states, as they showed in that struggle, were unable to do it or unwilling to do it or because of state pressures wouldn't do it, then the federal government must, even with the disadvantage cited by Senator Percy, because I believe our people want performance. They expect our country to be run right. And if it, to run it right, the federal government has to step in. I believe they want it to step in. That's what it's there for but giving every opportunity first to the states and localities to do the job for themselves. And that, it seems to me, is the whole principle of federalism. It broke down in civil rights. It, didn't, it hasn't been working so far in this field of local and state government, but we, we want it to work. And so if we, if we can do better because of New York's great trouble, which is a lesson to the country, I'd personally be delighted, and as a senator, aid it in every way I can. But I'm not going to see basic functions essential to the people unperformed because I have a hang-up about the federal government doing it. Well, I concur with the senator in this regard. The concept of the block grant, which uh, Congressman Quee was long an, a proponent of in uh, education, to get away from the bureaucracy and control mechanism, the categorical uh, kinds of programs that's, that laid down so many specifics that the new art form of the 60s was uh, how to design a grant proposal. Uh, the, the idea of the block grant works very well. Red, revenue sharing, I think, was rec uh, recognized and rated by Fred Nathan over at Brookings as 95% effective in its, in its uh, implementation uh, because it had a simple program under which the formula worked, the Secretary of Treasury required an audit and report, and, and a curious thing, which is a good idea that the use, utilization of the money had to be advertised in advance 
before it was implemented to the public, so they knew what the money was being used for. No geraniums planted around the town parking lot and so forth. You had to use it perhaps for a uh, better communication system for the police department. So the idea of a block grant with a simple control on it, I think, has a great appeal because we have now at county levels legislators and executives who can perform these functions very effectively without constant federal bureaucratic uh, direction and control. So where can we use block grants? Well, we can use block grants to better uh, effect in housing. Uh, we have the old 236 program, now we have Section 8, but it's not working because there's so many stipulations in Section 8 that it doesn't fit the uh, demographic or the, the geopolitical problem of a given area or region. Where can we use block grants further? In mass transit, because different kinds of areas need different kinds of either bus or uh, monorail or uh, combination of rail and bus uh, transportation systems. And uh, the states are equipped to design and, and have those function. I think in economic development, the block grant system can work as well. So the more we move to block grants, the more I think you'll get rid of some of the overload of bureaucracy at the federal level. That's a saving. And at the same time, uh, I think you'll get better effective uh, uh, performance of the uh, objectives of the federal government, housing, transportation, education. And I uh, firmly believe that the block grant idea is one which will I'd give like us to, maximum initiative. I'd like to throw a solution out, though, and see whether you can support it or chew it up. And it involves the executive branch of government as well as our votes. I think the Highway Trust Fund just has to be busted. I think it has to be dissolved. I think it's a disaster right now. It has an eight and a half billion dollar surplus of unspent money, and we spent, we uh, completed over 99 percent of the national highway system, and yet that money sits there. It causes uh, states to want to keep paving over everything when their mass transit is starving. So dissolve it. Create a national uh, transportation trust fund, or just put it in general revenue, and see if we can't have a sensible transportation system that's integrated and not just one based on building highways because they're causing our problems. They make us all the more oriented to get it out of the city, move farther out, so move the affluent out, move the factories out, let the workers commute by automobile, which is certainly making us far more beholden to the Arab oil uh, OPEC countries than it, it's in the national interest to get rid of this. But how do we do it? Well, Senator Jones, do you want to comment on that? on that? Yeah, I'd like to. The appropriation may be there, but I can assure you the money is not there. Yeah, we, we have weekends when we almost run out. And this year, we will have to go. You're familiar with that. <laughs> I, I think uh, 80, it should be clear there, there is no cash balance in the Highway Trust Fund. There no, is no cash balance the in the Social Security Fund. If you're going to spend those monies, that's you have point. to borrow that's the point. monies to spend them. Yes, but the important Because there is no cash balance. Or the money divert the revenues spent. from somewhere right. else. But the important thing that's being developed now, and I hope we'll continue with it, is you've all said what can be done on the negative. Cut expenses, cut the deficit hold things down. Now, America's never grown that way, but we'll do it because we have to. No, what no. About never said anything about cutting the federal budget. Well, All we want to do is slow down the momentum of it. It's got up 38% in two years. When you slow down years. the momentum, you're putting my people out of work. No, you have 12% no. unemployment. Look yeah. at the history of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's begun actually under Herbert Hoover, but Franklin put it into work. And Jesse Jones ran it. And it made money for the federal government. It took plants and even uh, localities of going into the tank and brought them back to life and supplied jobs. It was a guarantee mechanism. It said that if you build this plant or you continue to operate this business, we'll put the capital behind you in form of a guarantee in order to get you back into production. And when you have the uh, liquidity developed again, you're getting your capital return through profits, pay us back. It worked. Why don't we start it up again? Governor Kerry. We're getting a little way away, away from the subject here, the financial crisis of the city. The financial now crisis of the important. city of New York will never be solved as long as we have 12% unemployment across the state and 20% unemployment in the ghettos and 37% unemployment among young minority uh, men and women in the cities who are out of, out of school and out of work. Well, I don't that's think there's any question about that. You, that's, that's New York's deepest endemic problem. The fact that we do not really try to implement the Full Employment Act of 1946. And to do that, it's going to take investment and enterprise. It isn't going to be done by the dead hand of restricting everything. 
That's really what the governor is saying. Senator I thoroughly Javits, agree with uh, just as uh, in passing here, as you travel around this country, and as I've been in Arizona and Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota quite recently, there is not an understanding of that problem. And there is a real criticism of so called high living, high pensions, high salaries that are uh, envisioned by many of our people in this country. So I don't think that story has gotten across very well, and they're going to have to, there's going to have to be some discipline in the cities, too. I couldn't agree with you more about the discipline, but we also have to keep our eye on the, on the fact that positive measures have always been America's salvation. That's all. That's the only issue I raise. But as you know from the trade, Adding to the stock of wealth. Our basic thrust has been to increase capital investment. But it's awfully difficult to increase capital investment when the federal budget rises 38% in two years and the federal government comes in and takes out a third of a trillion dollars in 10 years. So no one has said anything about cutting anything or trying to slow down this eerie momentum which has really eroded our fiscal well, I'm trying to solve you. federal I'm budget. Trying to solve Ladies problem. and gentlemen, could we just pause for a few moments? The questions raised by city financial problems are many and far-reaching. Solutions are often difficult to find. Our panelists have presented differing solutions, but in general, they agree on some of the lessons learned by the New York episode and on some of the danger signals that can be spotted in any city that's headed for financial trouble. The big question, of course, is, having spotted those danger signals, what long-range policies can be adopted to help the cities maintain their solvency during times when they are plagued with the problems of inflation and recession at the same time? Now, to challenge our speakers, let's go to our experts in the audience. My name is Dick Nathan. I'm at the Brookings Institution here in Washington. And my question, I think, I would address to the whole uh, panel. We've done some research on the social and economic problems of central cities. And what you find that's quite striking is that the central cities, the core cities with the deepest problems, are particularly located in the northeast and north central regions of this nation. And if you look at the west and the southwest and the south in the United States, you find many cases where central cities are much better off than their suburbs, where annexation and uh, consolidation uh, have created situations where you don't have core city problems. Now, uh, that seems to me to point at something which has been discussed in what I think has been a very good uh, discussion uh, and conversation today, and that is, how can we devise a federal aid strategy, and many of you talked about changing federal aid programs, that doesn't, in effect, punish people who've consolidated and expanded and reformed local government in the West and in the South, if we aid the cities, the older cities in the northeast and north central regions which have core city problems and which have not done these things to spread burdens and reform government from the point of view of what most people would consider the correct direction as many people uh, talked about here. So my question really sums up to how can you devise uh, federal aids which don't discriminate against people who do good things in an effort to aid the core cities with the deepest problems. To me, this is a very central dilemma that's been alluded to in good ways, and I'd like to hear some direct comments on it, well, if I could. Will you comment on yes. that first, and then I we'll go to Governor that. Kerry, and then to Senator Percy. I really don't think it's a dilemma, because think of what our oldest cities have contributed to this country. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, the country owes them a great debt going way back before it became a country. And therefore, the fact that their problems are different and have to be modernized and brought along does not mean that their values should not be preserved. It would take at a minimum 25 years to 50 years to replace New York as a revenue source alone. New York produces over 15, New York City <laughs> produces over 15 billion dollars a year for the federal government and tax revenues. New York gets back at the most, if you figure everything, including what the secretary calls transfer payments, three and a half billion. That's $12 billion net. In order to get that out of a Houston or a Fort Worth in Dallas or, uh, or some other central place that may replace New York, take you 25 to 50 years. So for those values, the United States has to make 
show some special understanding for these older cities with their older troubles like New York, especially where the demography of the country and the constitution of the country require them to assume these burdens. Senator Percy. Uh, very briefly, the, uh, Dick Nathan's question is a good one, and I do think for the most part, federal programs have to gravitate toward where the problem is, and the older cities do have a preponderance of problems. But I think we can't ever, with the uh, largest of federal assistance, have a disincentive for cities to not do what is in their long-range best interest. We can never, for instance, continue to bail out a city that, that has a practice, such as New York has had, of enabling employees in their last year of employment, their 20th year, to load it with overtime so that we can take specific cases. A man earning $15,000 a year as a salary gets 17000 a year when he retires because he loads that last year. We can never reward a city that feels forever it can go on with rent control, which for a while distort the market and give arbitrarily low rents, but which then destroy the incentive to invest and to build and create new rentals of property, and therefore new property can be taxed. They've got to pay for it someplace, and we can't have a system that will ever forever be an incentive to bail them out of those practices which have to be discouraged, not encouraged. Yes. The... Uh question that Dick asks, I think, is really the fundamental question of society. I think what one has to decide is what is a national function and what is a local and state function. Now, if the care and well-being of the people is a national function, which I think we could possibly assume it is, then perhaps the federalizing of welfare so that everybody has a minimum level is a legitimate step. I don't think that means, however, that the people of the areas you mentioned should be required to pay for pension funds, which are not employee con contributed, or tax-free uh, or tuition-free uh, universities and hospital arrangements. If they want the local and state services, then logic supposes they should pay for it. Are we still on Nick Nathan's uh, question? Yeah, I think uh, we are. Okay, yeah, let's, let's let go to the next the question. question. Yeah. My name is Marion Barry. I'm a member of the uh, D.C. City Council in Washington and also chairman of the Finance and Revenue Committee. I'd like to uh, really try to bring this down to some realities in terms of what I see in the cities. If you, I get the impression people say that if you just manage what you have better, it'll be all right. But if you look at the increased costs in city governments and even in state governments, you find the increased costs comes in the aid to dependent mothers for children, the increased cost comes in Medicaid, the increased cost comes in trying to figure out a way to, to rebuild housing in the inner city. And it seems to me that that's the kind of thrust I like to, to raise here And why is it appears that the administration from the executive side is opposed to really pushing forward for 100 uh, percent federal uh, funding of welfare of all kinds as well as health benefits. And the other part of that whole question is with Section 8, which is a, a colossal flop in terms of trying to build some housing. So if we say that we'll liberalize welfare rules, which means that a person can come into Washington in 30 days, get on the road. We didn't ask them to come in some instances. We welcome them here, yeah, but we didn't ask them to come always. Or if the cities have decayed to the point where there's no more land to be used as in the Southwest, where you can continue to get new land and get virgin uh, territory. So my question to the Assistant Secretary is, what is the administration going to do specifically to move toward 100 percent federal payment for welfare and health? I mean, I think that's very, very important outside of any national health insurance, but just right now, do that. And the other area deals with housing, and this is to Senator Percy and to Senator Javis, about the Congress. What are they going to do? I know you are too individually pushed, but what are you going to do in terms of the Congress to make the executive come forward uh, with this kind of program or impose this kind of program on them. Because I, I resent the fact when people say that the cities of the East are mismanaged. They're probably no question about that. But I suspect if you look at the governments of the Southwest and the West, you'll find that they have some antiquated management problems too. So that's my general kind of concern I'd like to address uh, to the Assistant Secretary and to the Senator and uh, to anybody else who wants Secretary to pitch in. Yes, well, I, I think you start with what are your national priorities? And I would say that once you arrange those in a certain sequence, then you can figure out 
what types of revenues you'll need to pay for those. Now, if you want to go to the federalizing of welfare payments, which I've mentioned, I think would be a constructive thing to do, you <clears throat> basically have to recognize that that doesn't come out of thin air. That has to come out of someone paying the tax revenues for that. We have not had the tax revenue continue to meet the demands that we've been putting on our system. So if I try to say, what am I going to do about federalizing welfare, I should be required. And every other member of Congress and every other member of the administration should then be required to say, what is he going to cut out? As soon as you begin to start... Oh, wait, that's oh, I'm where you very start. sorry. We've cut that 40 percent in real terms since 1969, while we have doubled social payments in real terms since 69. There are some, and Mr. Laird may want to comment on it, and say that may be enough, or may have been too much even. So when you say <clears throat> that you want something more done, you've got to identify what you want less done. That means you've got to look at those total federal programs going from $7 billion on federal grants and loans in 1960 to $60 billion in 1975. Now, uh, as far as the guarantee types of programs, there is a great myth in our system that somehow a guarantee doesn't cost anyone anything. Principle number two of economics, beyond the concept of there is no free lunch, is that when you advantage someone, you disadvantage everyone else. And so where you give the full faith and credit of the federal government to one borrower, that disadvantages every other borrower. So there is a cost to it. You must recognize these kinds of trade-offs. I, myself, personally, individually, would support the federalization of welfare payments. I would strongly support the negative income tax as a much more efficient means of providing a status, a minimum threshold status, rather than the 1,009 social delivery programs that we have, which tend to be bureaucratic, inefficient, costly, and are really not satisfying either the recipients of those programs, they're costing the taxpayers more than they evidently should, and they're not really being supported by anyone. So what is the administration going to do about it? We tried in 1970, as you remember, the welfare reform bill. It got down to the five-yard line and wasn't punched in. The Liberals said you're not giving enough. The Conservatives said you shouldn't give anything. No one supported it, and the thing died aborted. But uh, that process can start again once people decide that the present situation is intolerable. Mr. My, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, when you get to the five-yard line and you're, you, uh, you're about to punch over, as you put it, I was in the Congress then. We made a massive effort. We got that bill through the House twice, and it died in the Senate. Now, when you get that close, you don't give up. You get the ball again, you change your play and go over the goal line. The president said when he was uh, inaugurated, uh, President Ford, that one of his major goals was the achievement of a national health program, a national health insurance program. Where is it? And if we're all for the federalization of welfare now, why isn't that a prime objective of this federal government? There's no disagreement. Why isn't there an initiative going on right now for the federalization of welfare payments? I agree with Mr. Barry that that would help the District of Columbia greatly, would help our state greatly. And that, if that's a national policy, why is the administration out there fighting to get that through the Congress? Either national health, which the <coughs> President said would be one of his first objectives, or the federalization of welfare. We are not going to have credibility in the, in the country anywhere if we state our objectives and then fail to try to reach them. Well, Hugh, I don't think you have a very good reading on the Congress right now, just living around here and being up there. I happen to be for those programs. I introduced them and then urged the Nixon administration to come up with them. But I can assure you that this co-equal branch of our government right at the present time is not of the mind or the attitude to move in those directions. And the President, I think, would be wasting a lot of uh, the energies that are needed and necessary to get some other things through the Congress. I think in the next session of the Congress, things like that may be considered. After the next election, they may be considered. Well, they said we wouldn't get a federal aid education bill, and the late Senator Taft introduced the first one in 1944. We passed it in 1965. Took a lot of heavy lifting. Well, I introduced revenue sharing for the first time in 1957, right. yes, but it didn't did. pass for about 20 years. Well, I think as long as you're talking about us, we better talk back. <laughs> <laughs> what is your opinion? My opinion is with you, uh, with the governor, because I believe, and I'm very favorable to President Ford, as is well known, 
I do believe that this is the kind of a battle that can only be won by persistence. And you, you do not, Mr. Secretary, see that on the banner of the administration, that is national health insurance of some kind, uh, and federal, uh, federalization of welfare. Now, the, the reason I say that is because neither of them is as hot as they sound, because we're paying right now a great part of welfare. New York, even New York City gets 50 percent, so does the state. Other states get up to 83 percent. Mississippi, for example. Again, there's argument about the formula, but that's the situation. Uh, and in the field, uh, so that's welfare. Now, national health insurance, I think it can be demonstrated that an intelligent plan will reduce the cost of health care to the American people when you add up Medicaid and Medicare and what the people are paying out of their own pockets and the way in which, in many, many cases, they are overpaying because of the disorganization of this system. Yes. And then we'll go to you. I'm Marvin Koster from the American Enterprise Institute, and I've heard some discussion here about federal loan guarantees. Uh, it's often said about these guarantees that they don't cost the government a penny. I'd like to ask uh, Governor Kerry and Mr. Jones whether they cost anybody anything, and if so, how that process works. I'm glad you asked the question because that's a fundamental difference between myself and the administration policy with regard to how to help in a condition where you need liquidity and capital. Right now, for instance, on Monday morning, unless we find the money, one of the best managed, most effective housing finance agencies in the country will go into default. It, it should not go into default. The reason it would go into default is because capital markets have closed because of the New York syndrome. And I'm down here today to seek some kind of a, a Band-Aid or a tiding over of that agency to avoid a default. Thirty other uh, states have similar agencies called moral obligation borrowing agencies. The guarantee of the paper of that particular agency wouldn't cost a dime because the Lockheed loan made money and it was a guarantee for the federal government. So the secretary, with all due regard to his policy of guarantees advantaging one and disadvantaging another, will not hold water. Guarantees are a successful way, an effective way, of putting the credit behind something which deserves a credit backup. If it doesn't deserve the credit, don't give the guarantee. If there's a price for the guarantee to be exacted, exact the price, so you make money on the guarantee and don't make the tax exempt with a guarantee of preferred security. This is what can help. But as long as there's a closed mind against guarantees, and the idea is that it's better to loan money and impact the federal government than use the guarantee mechanism, we're not going to get anywhere. The housing committee under uh, banking committee under Henry Royce put forth a program for guarantees for housing in marginal income areas. But Mr. Lyndon OMB is against it, and they won't use the law that's on the books that would enable us to build more housing than Section 8, which Mar uh, Marion Barry described as an utter failure. Why can't the guarantee mechanism, which is in FHA, Veterans Mortgages, Exim Bank, all of these things working effectively in the Lockheed loan be used to help in what is clearly <coughs> a liquidity problem in the entire United States. Right now, I want local and state, local and Mr. Rose on local and local You're filibustering. Right now, you local, ought to be in the Senate. Right now, <laughs> local and state governments have gone into deficit across this country, $7.9 billion. Cut New York is not the, the only facts. one in trouble. So I say use the guarantee mechanism. You'll make some money for the federal government. You'll cure the liquidity crisis, and you will really get something moving in this country. There are Secretary Jones. There, oh. 30 sec there are limited areas where the loan guarantee programs can help, such as in the SBA and SBIC examples. In the case of housing, in 1974, we put 20 to $22 billion into the mortgage markets. I'm not sure we added $1 of mortgage money to those markets. Now I'll let Senator Percy go from that point. I, I never heard such discussion. I'm very sorry that a member of the, of the House Ways and Means Committee would really feel that that is true. What a change you get going up to Albany, Hugh. If I came to you and I said I got a friend, now he's got a very bad debt payment record. He's just on the brink of bankruptcy, but Don't I'm going to ask you to guarantee his loan, and would you have to disclose that to a bank when you want to borrow more money yourself? You bet you would. That's a liability, potential liability you've got. And every time we put the guarantee of the federal government of the United States behind bonds for New York or New York State or New York or City of or, or, or Chicago or Illinois, you've got to take into account where they're going to be paid off. Exactly. 
The Don't give the guarantee down. unless there's a so clear that, so ability that you for can't payment. say it doesn't cost you a penny. Potentially, it may cost you 100 percent of that loan. No, no, may... Senator. I must disagree because the well, backup for the guarantee is this. I just asked my good secretary here whether no, or not he'll put the federal the backup, government's signature without any risk. The backup incurred. of the guarantee is the guarantee is not repaid. You impound other federal funds to discharge the guarantee obligation. Well, the fact you is can't oversimplify it. The fact is that, 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 that is the cost. <laughs> that is the cost. You see, there yeah, is you a don't, cost. The federal government doesn't lose the money. And, and there well, is a cost involved. <laughs> you just uh, said. You just I said think it. it's important, and the I'd like to hear said, from Mr. Jones on this. It works for the SBA. It works for the SBIC. In Why very limited way. In I very believe that you because you've got leverage there. But in the the concept that it doesn't cost anyone is wrong. Because what happens when you have a borrower who gets the full face and credit of the government, he borrows at a lower rate. That suggests other people borrow at higher rates. That's the cost. Mr. Jones, That's you the charge cost. a premium in order to uh, equalize that, and then you make the money. That's we do? The, you charge a premium. We don't. You did. Are That's, you saying we should? A, I might agree with that, but if you say a, we do, I would disagree. You'd better get together <laughs> with President Ford. He's charging us a premium on the loan of the money to New York City hopefully, in the amount of $2.3 billion. Dollars. a one-city aberration, well, not is, a governmental program. You mean it wasn't program. a good idea to help New York? You better convince Pre President well, Ford of that. No, the fact is, is it not that you make money? The United States has made money consistently on its guarantee program. On a no full overhead saying, basis? That's right. Just an overall program basis. or a billion dollars in default, Jack? But you, I said a on billion over, dollars. I know, but you got a hundred billion dollars in FHA upon which you've consistently made money for years and years. That's all the governor is saying. To sure you take prudent uh, guarantees, but the fact is that the record of the guarantee has been that you, it hasn't been an imposition on the federal budget, and indeed it's made a profit. Now that doesn't mean to be improvident or to be reckless, but it's a preferred source of financing where you're dealing with a revenue producing <coughs> operation. That's all. And I think it's only fair to state that if the cities, the counties, and the states want to go into a guaranteed program in the future, they're going to have to be willing to give up something. They're going to have to give up Agreed. tax exemption. And they're going to have to give up right. some of these other things. They're going to have to pay a premium for their money. Right. And it's going to raise costs as far as local and state government is concerned. It isn't a freebie for anybody. That's the right. program has come to an end, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Our time has run out. The American Enterprise Institute has been very delighted to present this panel discussion on the financial crisis of the cities with Governor Hugh Carey, Senator Jacob Javits, Senator Charles Percy, and Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, the Honorable Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, as you know, is representing Secretary Simon on this program today because of the cabinet meeting that was called by President Ford. But we do uh, very much appreciate their participation in this program. Thank you all for participating here in the studio. This roundtable discussion on the problems of rescuing financially troubled cities has brought you the opinions of four experts in the field. Their views, many of them differing, should be listened to. It's the aim of AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, to illuminate issues of the day by presenting many such views in the hope that by so doing, those involved in or those who want to influence the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. Public Policy Forums is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a copy of this program, write to the American Enterprise Institute at 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036.